Welcome to Freedom Friday and the River. I'm so excited to get to talk to you about some of the things God has done, is doing, and will be doing. And I'm here with my, could you guess that we're related? Mm -hmm. With my mother, Darlene Dakin. Welcome, Mom. Thank you. <laughs> so um, when we get talking, you'll need to pull your microphone up because everybody's going to want to hear what you have to say. Okay. <laughs> um, I put a post out that we are going to be talking about rejection today. And there are a lot of people that probably think, hey, that doesn't really apply to me. Would you have thought 20 years ago that it applied to you? No. I didn't even know what rejection was. But you found out. Yes. <laughs> that seems to be the way with a lot of healing. It's like you don't know you have it until God takes it. Do you remember that time that we were walking in the grocery store? I'd been set free from gluttony and I started yelling at you because I was like, mom, mom, come here because I no longer felt the pull to the, um, the little bakery aisle and it surprised me. I didn't even know that there was something funky going on as to why I had a hard time saying no, but after I got set free, I was able to pick that out, glory to God. So um, I wanna ask you just a few questions. Um, you didn't know that your issue was rejection, um, but, well, when do you remember noticing, did you, did you notice there was something wrong? No, I, I was aware of my emotions, you know, um, but when I um, was introduced and I, I read a book about rejection and then I knew that that was the reason why I acted like I did and why some of my behaviors was like they behaved because of that. So the book that I read on rejection is what made me realize that I, you know, that was what was wrong with me. Okay, now you have to know that anytime anybody has an issue, usually people around you kind of know it beforehand. I knew that there was some issues with rejection, but one of the problems can be when someone has rejection, it's not the same as when somebody has pride, you tell them they're going to, they're going to want to smack you, but it's hard to comprehend. And, and it, rejection becomes such a part of who you are and your behavior, you kind of feel like that it is who you are and people learn to respond to you the same way. But let me, let me just ask you, mom, just a couple of questions just to dig in with the uh, rejection because you happen to have been the one, one of the ones that was rejected basically at birth. Right. And uh, can I tell a little bit of that story? You can tell. Uh, so my, my uh, grandmother uh, became pregnant with my mother and um, uh, the man who raised her, actually my grandfather, um, adopted my mother. So. Grandma, I don't think, ever told you that you were adopted, but some of the other family mm -hmm. kind of told you that. Yes, the mom was open with it that I was, you know, after that, but uh, we didn't discuss it a whole lot. But I did know, you know, who my father was and a little bit about the family history. And one of the things we see in ministry is that early rejection tends to lead to roots of rejection, like if your mother didn't accept you, your father didn't accept you, perhaps you were made fun of. There's all kind. any rejecting behavior kind of can bring that out. And um, so did you have a hard time believing people received you? Yes, I did, even, you know, even in, you know, my marriage life, you know, I, I never really knew till many years later that Daryl Dakin really loved me. So you had a hard time believing, receiving love. Right. Um, what was it like growing up not feeling like that you belonged? Uh, knowing that I was different. I was completely different from the family I was raised in. I had six other siblings and I was the oldest and I am nothing like them. Somebody asked me once, you know, uh, what what do you have? Why are you, why are what ra ways are you like them? And there's nothing. There there's just nothing. So I've always been different. I always believed different, thought different, lived different. I have this opinion that when when an assault is against a person, like rejection, that the enemy will 
mastermind in his insanity points in a life. So rejected at birth, rejected, you came from a, a poor family, basically. Right. Rejected in, by, um, uh, I think grandpa probably loved you the best that he could, but there was some issues there. Right. Well, yes, especially after he had his own children, but also being made fun of school, you know, being poor and having people make fun of you at school, you know, that added to some of that. So you're being told that your father's not your father. You're getting made fun of in school. At home, you're, t you're taking care of the children and you began to have some nervous issues, right? Right. And I didn't know why my dad didn't want nothing to do with me. You know why he wasn't in the picture at all. So just the unknown yeah. hit you there. And then you married my dad early. Right, just when I was 17. <laughs> I was still a kid, but <laughs> grown up but still a kid. And what were your thoughts about your birth father? Did you ever think about that? Oh yes, I've always tried to find him. You know, from the time I can remember that I could write letters or look for his name in the phone book. I knew about the area he was from. So I was always sending letters off trying to find, find him. And there was a lot of people by that name, so I was never able to do that. Okay. Now, before we dive in, and I'm going to talk to you about this impossible task of finding this man, I want to give you some of the symptoms that the spirit of rejection may be at work. Now, we also call this heaviness, but um, I had mom before we started read through these and sh she could apply all but two. So it's not that if you have all of them, but if a majority of these tend to hit the spot, then you may wanna look and say, I may need some healing in this area. Okay, so the sorrow and grief, self-pity, embarrassment, shame, injustice, a broken heart, inner hurts and a torn spirit, regrets from the unfairness of life, excessive mourning, false responsibility, suicidal thoughts, gluttony, bulimia and anorexia, loneliness, heaviness and depression, discouragement and despair, dejection and hopelessness, inferiority and low self-esteem, results of sexual abuse, lack of praise and unpacified emotions, suppressed emotions like fear, anger, rage, violence, and hatred, self-hate, self-mutilation and self-punishment, insomnia, chemical imbalance, rejection, insecurity, and abandonment, and a familiar spirit of heaviness. It tends to go down through the family line a lot of times. So I'm gonna jump start this story to about, I don't know if it's been four or five years ago. Mother and I were traveling to a conference in Texas. And you have to know that you, well actually you, you located your father and went to go visit him. Was and that before the conference? Or it after was before the conference. Oh, okay. So uh, I just wanted to back up and say mm -hmm. what happened when he, did he know that you existed? Yes, I had found him a few years ago, maybe, I don't know, probably early 90s. And uh, in fact, my mother had called and told me where he was and where he lived. And Daryl and I left immediately and went to Ohio uh, to meet him. And um, because of my emotional status at that time, uh, Daryl took a trip and talked to my mother and then he went by to see where my real father lived because if it wasn't a decent looking place then he wasn't going to take me there or he wouldn't have told me where my father lived. But anyway, it looked like a good nice place so the next day Daryl and I went there and Daryl got out of the car to go talk to him. He was out in the yard uh, and uh, he didn't want nothing to do with me. and. This was really hard on my husband because he'd seen the heartache and pain that I went through. So, um, so he jumps in the car and he says he does not want anything to do with you and we left. After that I had to write him, wrote him a letter to tell him who I was, where I lived at, about my children, hoping that he would change his mind and contact me, which he never did. So there you are rejected again. Now, did he know that you existed before Dad told him? Do you know? He didn't seem like he did. Okay. But his name was on my birth certificate, and I think your dad said that 
that was a surprise to him. Okay. So, I don't know. Okay, so then you went into some emotional roller coaster after that, and then you, he didn't respond to letters. He didn't get the letters, actually. No, he didn't, and it was, it was very devastating. And then I realized that I was going to have to get over this. You know, it was going to hurt my family and hurt my life. So I guess I just tried to close the door then and not think about it anymore. Were there any lies that you believed about yourself or about God or about him or anything that took root at that time or before? I don't know. I always thought that if I found him, you know, that would be a different, you know, story. Because when I was younger, I used to think, you know, why can I not live with my real dad, you know? And, you know, what's that family like? And by that time, I knew that I had a sister about my age. And so that was a piece that I didn't have. And I also knew I had an aunt that I was named after. And so I had those pieces, not just my dad, not in my life, but my sister and then my aunt that I knew I had. And by that time, I also knew I probably had some other siblings, but I didn't know anything about them. And I tried to find my sister and my aunt, and that was impossible too. And I want to say that oftentimes we think, you know, if... If, we, if she could meet this man, if this could happen, things are going to be okay. But actually, the brokenness was contained in here, right? Well, I blame God because I said, God, why would you bring me all the way to Ohio and set me right in front of my father's house and for me, him not want to see me, for nothing to happen? Why, God, would you do that? You know, I couldn't understand why God would 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 do that so probably some anger towards God that just why did he make it happen why it, why did it even exist at all uh, the only thing I got good out of it was I seen his house and it looked like that he was a good family man it looked like it was a happy house you know kids was probably happy and so that gave me some comfort to realize that my dad was probably a very good man Okay, and you needed that. You needed to think that. Yeah, I couldn't have dealt with it. If, if um, I had thought anything less than that, I, I couldn't have dealt with it. Okay. So then let's go back up to this conference. Now, see, I know my, about my mother's heartbreak, and behind the scenes I've been looking periodically for this family since you know the internet's come about I'm looking I didn't know how close I was mm -hmm. but I always thought I'll find them first and if they're a bunch of jerks <laughs> she will never find out about them because I did not want her to be rejected and at this time I, I don't know that I was aware that the rejection was really at work but I wanted to protect my mother I have a good mother my mother is the best ever a prayer woman uh, she's my friend. We love doing things together. She believes in me even when y'all don't <laughs> or no one else does. So she and I drive to uh, near Dallas, Texas for this uh, conference and we're on our way back and we're having this conversation about her family because she is basically has given up hope. That's the only way you really could survive is just right. let that go and move forward. Right. But I think before that, um, a woman had called me. What is her name? Sherry. Sherry Ellis had called me to talk to me about something and was telling me about DNA testing, which we really hadn't heard of at this time, and um, that you could spit into a vial and they could tell you all about your family, which I really didn't think about this because she really had given up. But I was telling mom about um, a revelation that I got because, and I'm going to share that real quick, because Jesus is everything, knows everything, knew what her heart was. But if, um, when, if you can spit into a vial and the DNA can tell you who your parents, your siblings, who you were, what kind of blood, what percentage, what's, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, Irish or German or whatever you have, everything, who we are is contained in our DNA. And I got to thinking about that because when Jesus spit on that mud and, or that dirt and made mud and put that on that man's eyes, he was releasing the DNA of God Mm -hmm. And all that was into that man, and I got a whole new view of that little spitting ministry he had for healing. No wonder the man was healed. 
inc that was just an incredible thing. So I'm talking to mom about this. Oh my goodness, and contained in the spit of Jesus was the DNA of God. And she was like, hmm. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that did you pretty quickly decide, what made you decide to do a oh, DNA I test? I immediately decided I was going to do it. But uh, your dad, I also knew, because your dad had went through the pain just like you had of seeing me go through all this. And so I knew he was not going to approve of this one little bit. So I never asked him. I never asked his opinion. He knew I was doing it, and he didn't say a word, and I didn't say a word to him. So here I'm doing it, and I sent it in. And, uh, and it was a flop the first time. Yeah, it was. I had to redo it again. <laughs> so when we're on our way to Texas, she's had to retest. I think that's what that's, that part of the story, the timeline's a little off in my head. But So instead of her getting the results back, she's got to do it again. And they sent that to you. So we're on our way back from Texas. And we know the name of her father. And we know, according to what my grandmother said anyway, and we knew that she had a sister named Patty. And that's one of the re things I went off of trying to find them. So a weird thing happens. And this is one of the reasons why if you come to see me for ministry, I ha ask you to put your phone on airplane mode because while we're driving, my mother has never been on Facebook live ever before. And her phone is in her purse. And we are talking about the fact that she's adopted and we're wondering, do her siblings know? Because this is like a secret in the family. We don't even know if her brothers and sisters knew if you were adopted or not. We're talking about that. We're talking about family secrets. Mm -hmm. And our sons, my son and your son, call and say, at the, they're like, um, Mom, I think you and Mammy are having a conversation that is not meant for the public. And she's on Facebook Live. And Kyle is telling me this. I'm like, what? And so mom is answer, had dug in her purse and got the phone. And her, my brother is telling her, mom, I think you're on Facebook Live. And mom's like, I don't even know how to be on Facebook Live. <laughs> She's arguing with him. And I'm like, pull over whatever we've got to do. Turn this thing off. Because I'm like, oh, what have people heard? This is awful. Because all of the family secrets, things that could hurt people might be out there. And so literally in her purse, somehow, and she had a password on her phone, Facebook Live comes on in our conversation. I've never heard if anybody heard our conversation or not. Either. That also tells me if your purse is in your phone, the microphone, it can still pick up. But because of that, I have a really good memory of that. I'm like, mom, what would you do if that turns out to be that this man is your father? You know, and we're just kind of in bewilderment. Mom's really emotional about it. And at this point, she still has not received victory from, from rejection. And you have to know one of the ways that rejection takes root is through lies. So she believed God didn't care. She believed this man had rejected her, and he had, but she was still not a rejected woman just because a human had rejected her. And so... All of the lies, the mockery at school, the issues she and dad had had a tumultuous marriage before dad got saved, all of that had added up till she was rejected and alone, basically. And so we're coming home from Texas, and it's like, what's this going to be like if when we find out the results? Well, I remember coming home, and the results came in. And I, did you pick them up in the mail, or did they come over the internet? I think over the internet. Over the internet? Over the internet. Mm -hmm. And it confirmed the man you thought you were, was your father was? Well, I looked, and at first when I looked at it, it didn't have anybody that I real, realized. That I recognized their names. So then I went and I looked at the intercessory part, what I could find. Oh, the ancestry. And the ancestry okay. said that he had seven children and a daughter of another relationship. Well, I'm thinking, well, who's that? So could that be me? <laughs> you know, what's going on here? Because I knew nobody knew about me except for him, you know. And so, he wasn't going to tell. And he wasn't going to tell. So yeah. I knew nobody knew nothing about me. So I just assumed there's probably somebody else there. And so then I looked at his obituary and this, my siblings' names was not on there. And so I looked at his wife's obituary, and there for the first time in my life, I seen my sister and my aunt's name in that obituary. So, and then, so then it was trying to put the puzzle together that who these were, well, most of my siblings don't have much to do with Facebook, so I only 
was able to find a couple of them and I was able to then to find out who put the ancestry up which ended up being my brother-in-law which I became a huge Facebook creeper <laughs> once I got these names I'm creeping all over Facebook because I'm thinking again you reject my mama I'm gonna reject you <laughs> that's putting my minister hat down and coming after you so I'm like oh my goodness and what I, is this? I was writing their names down and who they had kids with, everything I could figure out about them, each one of them. And then so I, then we, at least even found out when my one sister was ministering in her home church. So we got to listen to her. And um, anyway, I, then I found out who the, uh, my brother-in-law that did the, uh, all the testing and did all the ancestry stuff. So I wrote him an email. And I said, I know this is going to be a shock to you <laughs> and to everybody else, but here, here, this is who I am. And, uh, but I do not want to uh, upset you all. You know my sisters better than I do, so you decide if they, you tell them about this. And if not, I won't contact you again. And then I had an awful time not contacting my sister that I knew that was on Facebook and an awful time not even contacting her pastor. Because you have to understand that uh, mom's been in ministry a lot of years. Uh, she and dad are currently, they're missionaries in Honduras. You've been there for the last 15 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and mom did some, she was the first in her family to graduate high school and then you became a nurse. Mm -hmm. You always had a desire for missions, but that wasn't, you've married a heathen man. That didn't work out so good for a little while. My dad was a flat heathen for a while and then he got saved and they went into the ministry as pastors and then they went to the mission field and now because of the pandemic and some issues, you all are um, ministering in Katie's at Living Waters, enjoying doing that. I see you all full of zeal. And so what menace, uh, although I think you didn't, you weren't raised up with grandma and grandpa going to church. No, nobody went to church in my family much. My grandma used, your mother, she used to tell me, let me tell you something, Lisa, you are not half the Christian your mother is. <laughs> Among other things, I love my grandmother. A lot of my personality comes after her. But anyway, so uh, when I came home, I remember you showing me the picture of your birth father. And then we knew that uh, you sent this email. One of the things I like is that mom gave her word in that email to her brother-in-law. If I want to know my siblings, but I know this is going to come as a shock. And if they, if you think it's going to be harmful, you need to let me know and I'm going to back out. Such a selfless act. One of the things about my mother is a very giving woman. And, and the fact that she restrained her flesh was a big thing because I certainly wanted to do that as well. And then he doesn't respond the first day. He doesn't respond the second day. And I'm starting to think somebody needs to get beat up. <laughs> and we're back in Honduras by that yeah. time. So you were in the States when you found out. They go back into Honduras. And you gave me, because your, your internet and electric's not always dependable in Honduras. So mother gave me the Ancestry.com, her uh, password and all of that. So I began to check it, right? You're right. And I checked it faithfully. Because one thing I wanted to do, I didn't, <laughs> I thought, this booger sends my mom a bad email. It's probably going to disappear. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> and I check it that morning, and uh, I begin to weep at what I see, and I called you crying, and you were concerned because I don't call. Right, and I checked it. You know, I, che I was checking it several times a day. You know, a week goes by, and I'm not hearing from nobody. And what's the response from him say? And, um, well, the response came from you because you, you called me in Honduras about five o'clock in the morning, which you never do, crying, and I thought somebody had died. And you said, uh, Mom, they've been looking for you. And I said, what? And she says, they've been looking for you. And I said, what? Because that could not ever be possible because nobody knew I existed. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, um, but my brother-in-law, um, the day that I went to see my father and uh, my sister Faith, who is Randy's wife, was upstairs making the bed and she seen our dad out talking to Daryl. 
and um, when he came in, she could tell there was something wrong with her dad. Now this is back when you found him for the right. first time, That's and Dad went in him. and addressed him. Right. So while Dad's out there talking to your birth father, your sister is watching and thinking something odd is going on, and you don't know this has happened, and they don't know about Mom. So from there. So when Faith came downstairs and her dad, our dad came in the house, she says, "Who was that man you were talking to, and what did he want?" And uh, she could tell he was really bothered, so he finally admitted that there could be a me. And so they never talked about it. It was never discussed in their household. But um, when Faith and Randy got married, he did all this ancestry and all this stuff in case I would ever try to find him and did the DNA because they knew about what age I could have probably been, and they knew, but they didn't know my name. They didn't know... Um, where I lived or nothing. I knew more about them than they did me. They just knew I existed. So when he did all that DNA and stuff, just in the hopes of uh, if I'd ever try to find him, I could. So all this time you're thinking that you're rejected, you have people taking DNA tests, building an ancestry tree just so they could find a sister that they only think might exist. Mm -hmm. So what'd that do to you? Well, that whole thing has just been just overwhelming to find that because it was just unbelievable. And it's still unbelievable when you talk to any of us. It's, it's, still, it's just still real fresh, which this has only been, I think, about three years ago. But we immediately, there was something else I was going to think about that before that, but I don't remember now. But um, uh, we began to make plans about seeing each other. Well, again, my rejection is I'm thinking my sister's just, telling me this stuff that she wants to see me and wants to meet me so but the thing that convinced me was that she uh, of course I've been in leadership most of my life and she had worked and we was talking about personality test and so she told me what personality she was and it was a different test than one I took but I looked it up and she sent me the results and I could tell she was um, the person that liked people in her home and she liked to entertain and all so that was why I knew then she was really serious about wanting me at her house and what's odd about it just to, this doesn't have to do with the rejection as much but uh, your siblings have incredible amounts of like you as far as Ted they're all Christians you're all the same mm -hmm. and um, your brothers from your mom and and my grandfather they'd all passed away and so even though your birth father had passed away you came into six sisters and one new brother mm -hmm. right right <laughs> and so then we set out getting to know them and I remember this God using this to begin to heal you. Emily, if you don't mind, put up the picture. There is a sister whom I think mom looks an awful lot alike. Um, and she is a pastor's wife. She's been in ministry. These siblings are teachers, much like my mom, been involved in ministry, which is just mind-blowing. And uh, mom and I went and spent the night with Faith. And when I woke up the next morning and I looked at her books, I was like, I have these books in my house how odd was it to realize that you really were engrafted into these people that you didn't even know I know we do have the same books you know it's it's, it's amazing uh, how much we are alike you know different they, they've got a lot of more um, creative abilities than what I have but their love for the Lord and, all, and also what was so uh, impressive is how they have went out of their way to meet me, come see me, uh, go places. My one sister came last year to the banquet. We've met in Lexington. One sister and I ministered in Louisiana and Texas. So that's what's amazing to me. It's not only me uh, wanting to be a part of their lives, but they're going out of their way to put me in their lives. And it was like we've never been separated and you were there Mm -hmm. when uh, that initial meeting and it was it was just like it's always been that way I would like to say that, that not everybody's story ends like this but you have a group of believers and I was amazed at how they weren't intimidated by you how they accepted you how they loved you how they enjoy being with you but I want to know how did your relationship with God what happened that began setting you free from this rejection. Well, that changed completely because when I could feel the love from them, 
even you know I had my children I had my husband I had family members that loved me but it was like I could not know that I could not feel that but somehow when they went and they went out of their way and they I guess it was probably the way our father rejected me but when they came out of their way that was the first time I was able to really feel the love of God through them and so it, it changed my life all the way around I remember you telling me as I me mean, as long as you have followed God I remember you saying I have just for the first time experience the love of God and you have to know that it's love that covers a multitude of sin it's truth that sets the captive free and when the, the love of God is finally able to penetrate how much it will wash away how has that changed you as a woman or how has that changed your walk just being set free from that well I'm thinking about the wall that you put up with people you know you're not going to be hurt again you know you're, you're not going to build a relationship because you're not going to be hurt even with your daddy and I you know it's like you'll never leave me I'll leave you first you know so the first times and you know that if I get upset or something I'm thinking in my head okay where can I go how much money do I have where can I go and where can I just escape and leave everybody and everything so nobody will know where I'm at so that that's that's the thing and being afraid of being left and I can even remember um, a different times when I had children and Daryl Dakin would never leave me but I always had that fear that when I um, after I had the baby he'd be gone and and there's he would never do that but in my mind you know I'm and you know just different people you, uh, but anyway it's and sometimes you still have to to fight that because it comes in you can sit in a church and feel like you're the only person there and the church should be completely full and um, you have to and one time I used to think well I will never be heard again and then I had a dream one night and that was just as painful as ever so the pain could be <laughs> could be still hurt well since you said that I want to bring up the issue of uh, inner vows because that ties into rejection there's several truths one is is that if people are rejecting you it's because they have rejection issues rejected people reject just like hurt people hurt but one of the things that can happen during the middle of rejection is making a proclamation that actually the enemy attaches to and then there there is bad fruit that comes from that and you may not even know what that came from for example someone who has just been hurt may say you will like mom said you will never hurt me again when that proclamation is made the power of life and death is in the tongue that proclamation is made the enemy begins to attach rejection fear of abandonment hardness of heart brokenheartedness anger rage all of those things can just be attached to that statement the problem with that statement is is that it's a wall statement but it's there's no trust in God it's basically saying God you can't protect me I'm going to have to protect myself you're not for me and uh, instead of turning to God and saying God I'm hurt please heal these hurts please protect me you begin to throw up that wall I think about spider-man how he throws up a web and you can feel that have you ever been talking to someone and for no reason maybe you said a word that triggered a thought of rejection and BAM they throw up that wall and you feel rejected and if you have any rejection issues in you when someone throws up that wall the fight can be on because I would say a lot I mean you and dad argued quite a bit mm -hmm. me growing up but I'm gonna say most of it was your rejection fighting his rejection mm -hmm. you'd reject him he'd reject you which would make back and forth back and forth back and forth which kind of lend when you've got children around you know that just kind of they begin to think that they're rejected and 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 don't know how to cope so early on rejection takes root and begins trying to destroy a life in the family unit now here's the thing the first person rejected was the snake in the garden <laughs> actually he was rejected out of heaven right completely rejected rejection belongs only to Satan and how often does he like to personify who he is he's the rejected one he's the rebellious one he's the prideful one and 
and he's forever rejected, like burning in hell forever, always rejected. And his character of who he is, he tries to toss that onto us, even without realizing that's who we are. So we, here we have the character of the enemy being tossed upon this girl who mom was a good kid. You know, grandma said you were perfect. <laughs> I <she> thought I was. <laughs> oh, that's hard to live up to, but anyway. And um, one of the things of of this personal vow of you'll not hurt me again. Some women will go, a man's never telling me what to do. I'm never getting to a situation where someone can control me. There's nothing wrong with being, not being in a relationship that's controlled, but saying that inner vow, putting that wall up is like an open door for rejection to come in. So one, you know, do you have to wait for, I mean, mother waited dozens decades in order to find these siblings who ministered hope, ministered mm -hmm. faith, which one of your sister's names is faith. Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? So what you can do is if we're talking, you're like, man, I've got some of those symptoms. First of all, you need to think about, have you said any inner vows like no one will hurt me? And the only thing you need to do is, well, do like this, say, God, have I made a declaration in my mouth that rejects other people and keeps me from getting healed? And you may remember saying, I'll never trust another person. I'll never have another friend. Whatever that is, God shows you. And just as easily as how you made that, you made that with your mouth, you revoke it. So you say, uh, like where mom said, no one will hurt me again, even though that's impossible. You still got hurt even in your dreams. That's pretty bad, mom. I know, I know that was bad. That hurt just as bad as the real thing. <laughs> so, but I didn't know. I, ne I didn't know it would hurt. You hurt. You know, I, didn't, I, I thought I was past being hurt. But the other thing is, and also saying, you know, I can't do nothing right. You know, all mm -hmm. these things you say about yourself when you, I'm fat, you know, I'm, I'm poor. You know, in Honduras, there's a lot of, I'm poor, I'm poor, I'm always going to be poor. Which are rejection comments. And so all you have to do is out your mouth is revoke it. Lord, I may have said, I will never be hurt again. But I revoke that statement. I revoke the control that I have tried to have over my life. And I give that to you. Come in and heal my heart and you be my protector. If you have rejected yourself, like I'm, I'm fat and ugly and no one will ever love me. Begin saying what the words say. I renounce the fact that I said I'm fat and ugly and no one will ever love me. God, I receive myself like you see me. You gave your life for me. You say that I'm beautiful. And even though I can't wrap my mind around that, I receive that right now because the truth will begin to go through that rejection. And mom said sometimes that lasts a little bit because you were born in rejection and all of your life there were rejection mindsets. What have you done to change now that you, God sets you free, what have you done to change your mindset so that you could live this out? Instead of saying, I'm not going to be hurt again, I'll just tell God on him. <laughs> Let him take care of it, and he will. It, it can be a bad situation, and you, know, you can ask him to take care of it, and it seems to smooth out really good. That's a good point. Well, if you notice, there are a lot of strongholds that work together. Rejection doesn't usually work by itself. It works with heaviness. It also works with fear. And you just mentioned fear of pain. It can be fear of rejection. Oh, the one of the worst fears is stand by myself. You know, uh, your dad worked third shift when we first got married. And I was petrified in that house by myself and he would really get aggravated because he said he didn't want a girlfriend he could pick up and take that home all the time because I would stay with my aunt and uncle but just terrified um, of you know being by myself and I will tell you the root of rejection is fear mm. and so if you are have fears fear of being alone fear of abandonment, fear of being rejected, fear of pain. Those are, you don't have to live like that. The Lord can reach in and grab that and take it out. But there are reasons probably why that came in. We see that, you know, with mom, there was a lot of rejection, a lot of chaos in your home. And I can also tell you about self-manipulation, which you don't even know this. But a lot of times through the pain, I would just bite myself as hard as I could to make myself have the pain 
that took away some of the heart hurt. No, I didn't know that. I know you didn't. <laughs> so with, uh, well, which is interesting because this talks about self-mutilation and mm -hmm. self-hurt right here. And you, was, you told me the two that you so didn't have. So it doesn't have, have to be cutting. It doesn't have to mm -hmm. be. Now, I want to tell you that if that happens to be an issue, self-punishment, uh, for some reason, that tends to be, uh, we, we tend to be people that, that like balance things out and feeling like we can take care of it or control. But some of the self-mutilation, did it, did it work? It didn't take you out of pain. It may relieve you for a moment. I guess it's taking that anger and the frustration out. And when you felt that pain, mm -hmm. you know, it took a lot of that inner feeling out. Okay. And what I want to say is that Jesus paid the price. So instead of leaning into his pain. And I don't bite myself no more. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> well, you see kids that'll bang their heads. Yeah, I'm going to peer, do a check on you every now and again. Uh, from cutting to banging their head, uh, there are some people that can't receive the forgiveness of God, so they will do a penance. We're not called to do penance. We're not called to go and perform in order to receive forgiveness. And the thing is, you don't have to bite yourself or hurt yourself or cut yourself. Jesus already paid for that. The thing is receiving it. And if you can't receive, if you can't think he loves me, he wants me, he thinks I'm beautiful, there's a blockage in there. And that blockage is causing the enemy to be able to come in. And nothing you can do to yourself is going to fix it. That's why people do drugs have all kinds of addictions is because they don't know that the way out is through the cross, through Jesus, and there is freedom. And the self-hate, you know, and one thing I can remember uh, when, my, when your dad talked to my dad, you know, I always wanted to look like him, you know, and that was one of the things I said, well, can you see him and me in any way? And uh, I didn't want to look like, you know, like I looked and uh, sometimes I still and you've seen me before I'll be you know oh I do not like my picture taken I don't like to be in the middle of that so well I'm so glad you brought that up because with rejection comes several other things and one of the things is self-rejection mm -hmm. you won't hardly find anybody with rejection uh, the spirit of rejection that doesn't have self-rejection and sometimes you'll find family rejection and anytime you hate yourself hate a part of you you're rejecting yourself which is not the will of god whatsoever have you have you have you started liking yourself a little better to a point <laughs> <laughs> i have to say this mom because mother was a professional nurse in corporate and it's not like she had rejection issues with everything because some people might find this hard to believe but it's kind of like you can be faithful with some things and something not as faithful. But I remember talking to you one time because uh, you, I, I was an administrator of a personal care home and you were in corporate. And so you would come in and drive me nuts, tell me what I was wrong. Mm. And I would be like, oh my goodness, I hated to see you come. But if I ever got in trouble, I always wanted to see you come because if I'd done what you told me to do, we were all good. So one day, mother makes these decisions and the nerd, there's some nurses in this other facility that are super mad at you because you gave them a lot of work to do and they are telling you off, talking about you. Now see, you would think somebody with rejection would cower down to that but that wasn't the case in this situation because I said, Mom, because, you know, you have an abrasive personality as far as uh, choleric type mm -hmm. D, you know, bossy and orderly. And a lot of people don't see the tender side, you know, that yeah. I see as your daughter. And so I said, Mom, don't you want them to like you? And you looked at me and you said, of course, I want them to like me, but it's not mandatory. <laughs> I don't have to take them home with me. Yeah. So it wasn't like that rejection had you in all areas because people could not manipulate you, but mm -hmm. there were a lot of secret areas where it had you gripped. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never cared. I mean, what people said about me never really bothered me. What bothered me is like the people I cared for just feeling that rejection and being le uh, um, uh, left by the people that I loved. And that's why I've never been a person that's had a lot of friends, but the people that are my friends, they're really my friends, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll be, th you know, through 
thick and thin with me. So. And I want to tell you that if you live with someone or you know someone that can't feel love, it doesn't matter how much you tell them you love them, if they have rejection, fear, they're not going to be able to receive that. It doesn't matter how much I tell my wonderful mama you know, that I loved her. She didn't feel like a good mother, no matter what I did. And so uh, we have to show grace and mercy, this great love that her new siblings have shown to her. I find that that works with other people. No matter how much people reject us, if our response is love, we can get through and help them uh, get healed. I can remember being in church service and a lady came up to tell me that God said to tell you that he loves you. And I thought, sure, you just come over there and tell me that. <laughs> bounces off of me yeah, and back uh, onto you. Yeah, yeah, you know, that you're just in yourself. I know he didn't say that. So with that in mind, do you think God loves you? Uh, that would just be one of the signs because guess what? You really can know the love of God. Now I'm going to go down pretty quickly on how to take care of rejection. I want you to know that next Friday we have a lady coming in. Debbie's going to be here and she was delivered from fear and, and there was rejection components in hers as well. But we're going to tell you the story about how God set her free from claustrophobia, fear of heights, fear of being in airplanes, fear of dogs, any kind of fear you could think about she had. And bam, you, you are going to love to hear that story. But let me tell you about how to deal with the rejection first of all. If any of this sounded true to you, and you're thinking, man, I might have some rejection issues, take it to the Father. And you're going to say, okay, God, I want to be healed. I want this gone. I want to know your love. I want to know who I am, and that no matter what happens, I'm accepted in you. And he will begin, if he hasn't already, probably has already, that process. Now, some of the things you can do to make it easier is you can begin to forgive those that rejected you. And you may think, well, I've taken care of that. Well, don't just assume it. Just say, Father, I give you permission to come in and tell me anything you want, even if it hurts. That's the big one, even if it hurts. And so God, show me anyone that I need to forgive. And as he begins to show you, you just say, okay, I give that to you, God. I give that to you, God. And if it's so painful that it's difficult, say, God, I want to obey you right now, but I don't know how to do that. Just show me how to forgive. And then if there's anything you need to repent of, for example, when mom said she, you know, she blamed God because she didn't know her father, some things she found out later was it was a good, it was out of timing. Aren't you glad that it worked mm -hmm. out the way it worked out now? It had to work out that way for I would never have known my siblings. Yeah, so uh, she, she, I would say just saying, okay, God, if I haven't trusted you, I've thought you rejected me, I repent for that. So you're going to repent for whatever you need to repent for. And what we didn't uh, say, and I'm not going to go into it, but what God was doing was he was protecting me. There's things my siblings went through that would have destroyed me. And um, so the things I believed wasn't always just correct. You know, I, I believed things one way the way I wanted to, and that was not really the truth. So God was, through it all, was just protecting me. He just, I mean, he protected me from just beginning to the end. So he had it, you know. So when I'm blaming him and all that, and you know, he's probably really disgusted because he's just thinking, I, you don't know what I'm saving you from, girl. <laughs> and that's true. We can, we can, this is hindsight. She's got the big picture now. So you can say that. So I like what you said. You believe things that weren't true. So that'd be the next step. Repenting, forgiving, and saying, God, do I believe any lies that aren't true? That's tying this rejection to me. Get you a paper and a pen. And when, he, when you say, God, are there any lies I believe that aren't true? Now listen, it has to be that you might be surprised because if you knew it was a lie, you wouldn't believe it. And it doesn't matter what he tells you, write that down. It may be hard to believe that you really want it and that God's got the best for you. That might be hard to believe, but if he shows you any lie, write that down. And then after you write that down, write down all of the lies, you're going to say, okay, God, do I need to forgive anybody to break these lies? Do I need to repent anything to break these lies? And I confess. And then go through your list, confess it as a lie. This, you're breaking up. This is the process of breaking up with those lies. So I break up with the lie I'm not wanted. I break up with the lie I'm unworthy. I break up with the lie I'm better, people would be better off without me. I'm breaking up with the lie that people would be better off if I were dead. I'm breaking up. You just begin to say, I break up with this lie. I break up with this. But you're not finished yet. 
When you finish that, to finish the process, you're going to say, okay, God, I receive that these are lies, but I have to know the truth because you want to replace. You don't want to just take re flop rejection out there without getting acceptance. You're only halfway done. And this is the part that actually breaks the whole lie down to where you can believe the truth. So you say, okay, God, give me the courage to believe the truth. And it can be scary to ask God the truth because what if he really doesn't want, to, want you? What if, you know, all those are lies, but lies, lies are so compelling for some stinking reason. And so say, God, just show me what the truth is. And as he begins to say the truth, you can write them down, but out your mouth, confess it. If you hear, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, confess that. If he says, I love you and you're my child, confess that. If he shows you a picture of a father being proud of his child, confess that. Doesn't matter what it is. When that comes out your mouth, that rejection will begin to get cut off, which is a wonderful thing. So you're, gonna re you're going to repent. You're going to forgive. You're going to cut off the lies. You're going to renounce the lies, receive the truth, and then for good measure... You're going to sit with your back straight and you're going to say, now, every door that's been opened in my life that has allowed the enemy access, Father, I ask that you close that door right now and I hereby send an eviction notice, rejection, fear, death, whatever you can, whatever comes to mind, I command you to go right now in Jesus name. Fear of not being loved. Hatred of myself, shame, selfishness, depression, all of that goes. I'm breaking completely up with you. I am beloved in the Father. And then begin speaking those truths. And I want to tell you, you will be healed. The Lord will set you free. And isn't the journey wonderful? It is. It's great. <laughs> Say that where you get it. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love to see my mother full of joy. You know, because being raised up, you went through a lot of depression right? Yeah. And that does not, I'm not affected by that. If the enemy tries to say it caused anything, I'm good mm -hmm. to go. <laughs> but I did get to see the effects of what fear and rejection do. Mm -hmm. And I see you now in the difference. And I think your dad sees a, a big difference. Mm -hmm. And so, um, do you have anything else to say or anything we forgot to talk about before we close this out? I don't think so but anyway the sad story ended up being wonderful <laughs> <laughs> and it's great because we spend as much time together as we can wherever yeah I love that God has restored your family of course your father passed away many years ago mm -hmm. but that's okay God has still restored your heart right. and you've gotten to know some things right and I've spent some time with my older siblings are the first family that I was raised with you know I try to make a point to see them uh, which was not always the case either. Mm -hmm. So God's healing all mm -hmm. the way around. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. Listen, if you have any questions, you can email office at tothe-river.com. If you'd like more information on being free, you can go to miracleofdeliverance.com or on to the river. There is a video discipleship section and there's six steps or six keys to freedom. Check those out. Those videos take less than an hour to go through and they'll help get you set free, but we'll see you next Friday for freedom Friday with three o'clock at Debbie. Thanks for hanging on and joining us.